In this service, I'll be focusing on that power that raised him from the dead. And I would like us to begin by looking at a story in the book of Luke, chapter number 24, the resurrection day. I'm looking at the resurrection day being the topic of our subject today, the resurrection day. And this story is in Luke chapter number 24. I'd like to read verses number 13 up to 19 and then pick up from 25 all the way to 45. And please, if you will, let's read together that the very day two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days. And he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Let's jump and go the way to verse number 25. And he said, and to them, O oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Verse number 27. And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they drew nigh and to the village whither they were going. And he made as though he would go farther. And they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening. And the day is now far much spent. And he went in to abide with them. The next verse was number 30. And it came to pass as he sat met with them. He took bread and blessed it, and broke and gave them. And their eyes were opened up, and they got to know him, and he vanished from their sight. Verse number 32, and they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And when he opened up to us the scriptures, that's very interesting. Did our hearts not burn within us? Look at that. Our hearts not burn within us when he walked with us and shared with us the scriptures. Mm -hmm. and the next verse. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. Mm -hmm. Verse number 34 saying, The Lord is reason indeed and has appeared to Simon. I would like to jump all that because we'll be cruising through the scriptures and God, verse number 45. Then the Bible says in verse number 45, then, then he opened their understanding that they may understand the scriptures. Look at that. He did what? Can we read that again? He opened so that they can do what? To understand the scriptures. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this wonderful day. We thank you for the power of your word. We pray that this word will be open to us and that we will be able to understand the scriptures. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. The verses that we have just read this wonderful morning focuses on an event happening at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And this particular event that we are looking at, that is the resurrection day, concerns two of Jesus' disciples that had set out on a journey 
a seven mile journey from Jerusalem to a place known as Emmaus. And it is in this episode that we see the climax of Jesus' earthly ministry. Then we find something happening while looking at that story. We find that the central focus of this story really focuses on what Christ did in the end in his encounter with the disciples. He taught them how to understand the scriptures because the view that these people had or his disciples had concerning the Old Testament was not a correct one. And it is possible that most of us can have a wrong view of the entire writing of scripture. And because of this wrong understanding of scripture that these two disciples had held, the Bible tells us that their hearts were cast down. They were discouraged, they were sad because of the events that had happened. They had not expected that Jesus Christ would be killed on the cross and he would be buried. That was not what they were expecting. They were not expecting that such a thing would happen because they looked forward to having him redeem the nation of Israel. But then what goes on with this is really what is the subject matter of our story today. So I would like us to look at some seven things that will help, uh, help us understand this very journey from that place known as Jerusalem all the way to Emmaus. A seven mile journey, a whole journey that Jesus took with his two disciples. Remember, for them to be called disciples, they must have been with Jesus. One as if you were son. They must have been with Jesus. And in my own imagination, this might be people that were with him throughout the three and a half years of his ministry. They must have probably been those people that have watched him distribute bread and fish to the 5,000. They must be in the company of people that saw the miracles that Jesus performed. They must be there when the voice of God spoke from above and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. They are called Jesus' disciples. One as if you were son. One as if you were son. In other words, they belonged to his company. So in this seven things that we're just going to discuss, we want to, to unravel the whole of this chapter and the events happening during this day when Christ and just resurrected from the dead. The first thing that calls attention is the seventh mile journey. Why? Would these two disciples engage in a seven mile journey? Why would the scripture sample out and limit the journey into seven? Now, I want to believe and make a strong suggestion that some of the things that we find in scripture, numbers and the words that we find written in scripture, they're not just there for the sake of it, they are there for a significant reason. Praise the name of the Lord. When you look at the language of numbers in scripture, seven is the number of perfection. It is the number of God. And therefore, by looking at that seven mile journey, wouldn't be a matter that we would just be looking at arbitrary. It must be something that we put keen attention to it. In the book of Genesis chapter number one, Verse number two, the scripture tells us very well that God took six days of work and rested on the seventh day. And this is something that God did in restoring the once beautiful creation that God had put together in the universe when he set up his hands to do the work of creation. Our God is perfect in every sense. He created everything perfect and everything in a good order. But the scripture tells us that which had been once created in a perfect sense. A time came when it was brought into a state of chaos and disorder. Requiring for a restoration. And this takes God six days of work. And then on the seventh day God rested. That is the first time we see the use of the number seven. One as if you were son. 
That is the first time in scripture. He is set up a structure on how something would be laid out to completion. Praise the name of Jesus. So number seven is a number of completion of that which God has to do. Amen. Seven, six days of work and then completed by a seventh day of rest. Praise the name of Jesus. Another example is what we find in Genesis chapter number two. Oh, really, it's a statement actually, Genesis 2, 3, commenting on that which we have just talked about. The Bible says, and then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that it is, he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. So basically what we see there is God bringing to a completion, bringing a rest in the end of a tedious work. Praise the name of the Lord. And therefore I want to switch on to another example that would attest that really seven is a number of completion in that which God is doing concerning a person, concerning a thing. In the book of Exodus chapter number 12, verse number 15, we see God telling the children of Israel that day they were going to leave Egypt to cross over the Red Sea and begin their journey to the land promised to their forefathers. The Bible says in verse number 15 of Exodus chapter number 12, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day shall you put away leaven out of your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So God commanded the children of Israel, as you leave Egypt, the one thing that you must be careful is to put away leaven from the first day all the way to the seventh day. And we find seven is a number of completeness, as we have realized from the beginning. And therefore, God is telling them for a complete period of time, from the first day to the end, you shall not have leaven in your houses. And we will discover in scripture that leaven is a type of sin. So God doesn't allow sin in our lives at any given time. Hallelujah. So seven again is used in matters having to do with dealings with sin. Now for us to be able to understand very clearly, we find in First Peter chapter number 3 verse number 8, the Bible says, remember, beloved, do not be ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. Now, if we will look at what we find in First Peter 3, 8, relative to seven days, then we will find something. Immediately after the fall of man, God started a work of restoration. That helps us understand that restoration is not an event, it is a process. And just as God took six days in restoring that which had been destroyed, following an act of sin from the one that we know as Satan, it takes God another six days to restore that which again was destroyed through an act of sin following man's rebellion. When Adam and the woman in the garden failed to keep God's command, you know, God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he a son of man that he should repent of what he has said. God had said, the day that you shall eat of this tree, that day you shall surely die. And therefore man found himself in sin. And completely distanced from the presence and from the glory of God. And therefore this ruined man by sin, this destroyed man by sin, he needs a restoration. Now I'd like you to see something. That God has set up a pattern in matters having to do with the restoration. By what he did in restoring the material ruined earth. It took him six days and rested on the seventh day. And now God has to take six days and a day of rest in restoring this ruined man. And from the time of Adam, God has been working on restoring man to this day. Hallelujah. 
As a matter of fact, according to biblical history, and if you count the years properly, from the time of Adam's fall up to today is about 6,000 years. Hallelujah. And what Christians look for is the coming of our Lord in his kingdom, which talks about the millennial reign, the 1,000 year reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now if we are living in the last days and we are just about to enter into that time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, then according to how the scripture is correctly arranged, then you have six days that God has been dealing with man to restore him fully in a place where there is no sin, there is no smell of such a thing into a glorious place, in a place where God will rest from the work of restoring man. It takes 7,000 years. Again, looking at seven, you realize we have six days that are already gone. That is, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and then we have one day that is remaining in God's economy. Seven, the number of completeness, the number of perfection. Now let's get back having laid that foundation. Let's get back to what we find in, uh, in, 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 in these disciples. This man was engaged in a seven mile journey which significantly would point to the journey of a Christian from the time they begin their walk with Jesus up to the time they are received up in glory. Praise the name of Jesus. It must be a complete period of time. It must be a whole period of time walking with the Lord. Hallelujah. And I pray that as these two disciples of Jesus Christ, their mouths going disciples, found Jesus or had an encounter with Jesus throughout the journey, that we will have an encounter with the Lord in our journey of faith. Hallelujah. I pray that we will not go alone. We will not just walk the two of us without the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of us. And that's why I love that song. You know, Nita Tembe Anawe. Katika safari yangu tatembe yanawewe. What if you walk alone? When these two walked alone, they had questions, they had difficulties, they had doubts, they had things. But when he came in their midst, and started to walk with them, things got a different turn altogether. The Bible says that they were downcast. Their hearts uh, were downcast or they were sad because of what had happened concerning Jesus. They had heard, not even that they had heard, but they had witnessed the crucifixion. They had witnessed the suffering. They had witnessed the shed blood. And they were worried while all this cruelty had to happen upon the one that God had earmarked for the redemption of the nation of Israel. They could not even understand why all this was happening. And that formed the basis of their conversation. They were sad, they were bitter, they were angry because the one that they looked unto had probably circumvented that which had been circumvented and it wasn't very clear in them what really was happening. But you know what? I thank God because through what we see in them, we can be able to learn something in our walk of faith. Hallelujah. And this pushes us to the second thing. The second thing that we see with this particular gentleman. Number two, these people had an encounter with Jesus. The first one, they engaged in a seven mile journey. That all of us must engage in a seven mile journey. We must engage in a complete journey. Bible tells us we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but we are of them that believe in the saving of the soul. We look at that which is set before us, the joy that is set before us. And though sometimes we may have to endure pain, we may have to despise the shame, our eyes are to be focused on the joy that is set before us. Praise the name of Jesus. So we must look at the journey to the end. Hallelujah. 
And therefore, in their encounter with Jesus that we find in verse number 14. Let's look at verse number 14. In this encounter, the Bible says, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. You know, it is obvious believers in Christ will discuss matters having to do with their walk of faith. Is that all right? Is that okay? We will do it in our fellowships. We will do it in our, in our jobs, in whatever we are. Our discussion is centered on matters having to do with our faith. And therefore, these two disciples were discussing matters having to do with their faith. And what had happened, like we have said, was this whole episode of discouragement because their hopes had been shattered down. But the Bible says when they were in that particular situation, Christ mysteriously appeared among them. You know, the Bible says, and we discovered this in our scriptures yesterday, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. There are times when our hearts can be discouraged, then when our hearts can be downcast because of what we go through life. But God remains faithful. Philippians 1.6 says, I being persuaded that the good work that God started in you will be preserved until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, that which God started with you the day you began your seven mile journey will be protected until the day Jesus comes back. Let me say this. You can deny him, but he will never deny you. Tunalawana you can forget him. You can forsake him. But he will never forsake you. He will never deny you. And David learned his secret. He learned the secret. No wonder he said in Psalms 23 verse number 4. Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death. That is the darkest moment of his life. I will fear no evil for you are with me. David is resilient. David is full of faith. David is rejuvenized in the inside. Though he walks in this dangerous path of life, he knows God cannot leave him. Psalms 46 verse number 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. One as if you are son. So when we are troubled in our hearts, that is a time that we see God in our lives. No wonder what we see in verse number 14. In the troubled moments, Jesus appeared right in the midst of their company. One as if you are son. Hallelujah. Jesus does not walk away from us simply because we are in difficult times. No. He doesn't run away because we are going through a crisis in life. It is in that particular crisis of life where we can easily see the presence of the Lord in our lives. Amen. So without even acknowledging him, without even knowing that he was in their midst, Jesus started walking with them in that particular journey. And I would like to put to us that Jesus is walking with us. Turn to your neighbor, tell them you are not alone. We get confused. We get perplexed. We get pained because of what we have to go through. I mean, talk about this lockdown. Some people are without, you cannot be able to travel. Imagine you cannot be able to go to Nairobi. You cannot be able to do anything. That means some businesses are crumbling down. Things are not working out. Some people are going without salary. Some people's lives have been affected. And there are complaints all over on social media and everything. But I would like you to know that in the turmoil of that confusion, God is with us in this. Praise the name of Jesus. God will never leave us. All what God wants us to do is to understand the scriptures. Hallelujah. There is a reason why things happen the way they happen. And if we don't understand that, then we'll have a problem. Now look at these two young men. These were guys that have been with Jesus. And although they sat in his meetings, they sat in his seminars, they sat in his teachings, they lacked a proper understanding of scripture. And it is possible that we can be 
in this walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we encounter crisis, when we go through problems, we, it is possible that we can have a deficiency of understanding in the matter of scripture. In fact, our spiritual maturity, our spiritual growth is measured by the times that we go through crisis or difficult times in life. If you really want to know if you are mature in the things of God, look at how you behave when you find yourself walking in the valley of the shadow of death. When you find yourself in that difficult time of your life, it is possible to behave like these two disciples. They behaved differently from what everyone would expect simply because they were going through a problem. There was a spiritual crisis, a spiritual uh, problem. There was a crisis in their faith. They didn't believe that this is the man that they had put their faith in. And when we find ourselves in difficulties, in problems, we question the basis of our faith, the validity of our faith. Huh? Where is God when I am suffering? We begin to question. Huh? We begin to question when the Bible says, wait on the Lord. You know, we begin to question what the Bible means by saying all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Yeah? We begin to question what the scripture says that our present sufferings cannot be compared with the glory that will be revealed on us. We question the word of God. All that is a lack of proper understanding of scripture. And this is the third point that we are finding in our study of these two disciples in their journey to a mouse. They lacked a proper understanding of scripture. Point number three. They lacked a proper understanding of scripture. It is possible that we can lack a proper understanding, a proper grasp of what God says in his word. Hallelujah. Did you realize that this word of God is forever settled in heaven? It is set tested seven times to be found true. God cannot miss his word. The Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. So everything that God has said concerning his word is true concerning your life. You may doubt it. You may not walk by it. But that word will never change. Praise the name of Jesus. And therefore, what we find in this in these disciples is very intriguing. They lacked a proper understanding of scripture. And this is seen in the way they arranged their thoughts, in the way their conversations looked like, in the way they cast doubts to the things that they had been taught, they had been learning from him. You know, they questioned them. They questioned that which Christ had spent time, three and a half years, Speaking to them, they were questioning the scriptures because of their ignorance, because of their improper understanding of scripture. When we don't understand God's word, we question the word of God. And the greatest mistake a believer can do is to question God, question the word of God. As a matter of fact, that is the greatest scene in the Bible. Doubting the word of God. Doubting that which God has said. It is what is called unbelief. Hallelujah. When we don't believe in the Lord. The singer sang and said, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Praise the name of the Lord. What a joy when we take God at his word. So this people, though they were disciples, and it's possible to have people in the church that have been saved, that has been serving in places of leadership, that have been known by everybody, that have walked in faith to find themselves in this place where they are putting or they are casting doubts to the word of God. It's not a wonder you go to board meetings of church leaders, you go to fellowship meetings, and you hear believers and leaders 
raising some strange comments against the word of God. It is not a strange thing because we are tested in our hearts and if we are not consistent, if we don't take a daily bath in the word of God, if we are not led by the spirit of God according to Romans 8, it is possible that we can cast doubt in that which God has already said. We lack a proper understanding of scripture. Can somebody say amen? There's no other life that we are called to. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that the righteous shall walk by faith. We are called into a life of faith. And faith is taking God at his word. Faith is believing that all what God has said is true. Faith is start taking a positive action towards the, the, the word that God speaks to us. So these people were actually not thinking the scriptures. In other words, by not properly understanding the scriptures, it puts us in a place where we conform to this world and not to get our minds transformed and renewed in accordance with the word of God. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and that which is acceptable and perfect will of God. It is possible by not engaging properly with the word of God to cast doubt or to have an improper understanding of scripture. In the church, in every gathering of God's disciples, there are those who take it in, there are those who allow the word of God to gravitate in their hearts and effect change in their lives. At the same time, there are those who take the word of God casually. They don't allow it to change them. They don't allow the metamorphosis, that change that moves you from one point to another. And therefore, we see them by their behaviors. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits, the fruit of their lives. That is their beliefs, their actions, and their words. Hallelujah. And therefore, we can learn something from these two disciples in our seven mile journey, in our complete journey from the land of our birth to the land of our calling. We need to learn something and correct some mistakes that we see in these particular disciples. It's true they were followers of Jesus, but they had some deficiency that we don't need to have. They lacked a proper understanding of scriptures. We need to have a clear and a proper understanding of scripture. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 2, verse number 1. Therefore we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest any time we drift away. We drift away. It is possible to be in a service like this. And immediately after we are out there, you ask a person, what have you learned? They will just tell you the service was so good. Pastor spoke very well. He was a blessed man of God. But excuse me, what have you just learned? No, the pastor was very anointed. He actually spoke very well. And my life is changed. But you are saying, wait, what did you learn? So when you take an audit of what that person has learned, more often than not, you find those people have probably nothing. And it is so sad. You know, I bombard you with notes. One of the reasons why I send you so many notes is that at your own time of study, you can go back to the scriptures and go through them. Somebody wrote me from the U.S. and he told me, I use your devotions every day. I use your sermons and whatever you send to me to do my personal devotions. And I was like, oh, bless the name of the Lord. Now this person takes my notes and he goes and he begins to listen to what the Spirit of God is speaking to him and writing some you know, additional notes onto that which he has gotten. This is really very good. That is the spirit of a disciple. Banas, if you are son. It is the spirit of a disciple you want to grow. But a lot of people, they get the notes or they get the stuff and they forget about it. And when something happens like what it happened during this period in time, the resurrection day, you know, people begin to question because they don't understand matters from God's economy. Now, number four, these disciples 
believed only in some facets of scripture. They did not believe the whole counsel of God. They were selective in their beliefs. They only understood some part, certain portions of scripture. Look at what Jesus tells them in verse number 25. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Verse number 27, and beginning from Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. That's very profound. It's very important. So what we discover with these disciples is that they had not believed in the Old Testament. They had believed in the fellowship, in the company, and in the teaching that Jesus was, you know, was, was, um, was teaching them. But there were gaps in their lives. There were gaps in their understanding of scriptures. They had not clearly understood what the prophets had spoken concerning Jesus Christ. They not even understood about matters surrounding the sufferings and the death of Jesus Christ, which was already documented in scripture. When you look at Isaiah chapter number 52, Isaiah speaks about the revelation of Jesus, the, the sufferings and the death he would experience through the hands of his own Jewish brothers. He talks in Isaiah 53 how he sees him smitten and stricken by God and how by stripes people are healed. This was 700 years before Jesus Christ ever went to the cross. And these disciples needed to understand that because the prophets had spoken about it. Hallelujah. Yeah? Prophets had pointed that would happen. So they needed to have understood that. But they chose to believe in what they had already grasped. And that's the biggest problem with many believers. They choose what they want to hear. They don't want to understand the whole counsel of God. And that lies the danger. You know, we are to receive the scriptures as God gives us. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. We are to search the scriptures and understand the full counsel of God. And what you see here is actually Jesus rebuking them, correcting their ignorance through the teaching of the scriptures. He calls them foolish men. Jesus could not understand why these disciples did not understand the scriptures. He looks at them, verse number 25. Yeah? He said to them, oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe. Just imagine, how many of you love Jesus in this house? If you love Jesus, lift up your hand and say hallelujah. You imagine one day you are lifting up your hands and you are worshipping. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. Oh, you are great. And then Jesus speaks to you and he calls you. Lillian, you are foolish. What would you do? Yeah? You run away from that prayer room. Because I'm going to go I mean, think about it. These words coming from the mouth of Jesus. Foolish. Look at your neighbor, tell them, I'm not calling you foolish. But that's what Jesus said. Eh? Imagine, this is the strangest word that I've ever found in scripture. Jesus called them foolish. And slow of her to believe. All that which the prophets had spoken. He called them foolish to correct their ignorance. And when Jesus sees that we are acting purely out of ignorance, he has no better words to call us. Huh? He has no better words. Just imagine how many times Jesus has called you foolish silently. Don't tell me. But just imagine when you didn't walk by faith. You walk in your own desires and in your own persuasions. Not in the word, but in another way. Jesus looked at them. Their ignorance being found in two things. One, being slow of heart to believe. In other words, these were slow learners. They were slow learning students of that which was taught. They were not able to capture. They were not able to grasp that which Christ was 
spending time and teaching concerning that which would happen in his life. Hallelujah. And we realize from the scripture that the purpose of his coming, he came to die. We sing about, you live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose, tumbled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me. He lived to die. He came to die. He was raised up by God to eventually die on the cross. That was the purpose of his coming. He came to be a ransom for many. He came to pay for the penalty of sin. He had no other business. But these young guys did not grasp that the death would be necessary. Mm -hmm. And the prophets had spoken about it. The second level of ignorance was that they did not understand what the prophet had spoken about it. In other words, they had picked what they had heard from the prophets. Today, people are running up and about, you know, trying to pick what they want to hear of prophecy. They don't want to hear the full counsel of God. People flock in places where they are told you'll prosper, or oh, you'll be lifted up, your chicken will multiply this year. Oh, the word of the Lord, you will not stumble. You will not. And those are things that are not properly founded in the word of God. It's good for me to tell you this is a year of prosperity and run by that theme. But what if you don't prosper this year? You look back at me and you call me a liar. Is that okay? Is that all right? If I tell you this is a year of restoration and I cause you to believe that you'll be restored. If you're not restored, I'll be dodging up and about trying to find another word to cover what I said concerning your life. But the word of God is not like that. Praise the name of Jesus. Prophecy. It, uh, you know, God's prophetic word. It, it is like a two-edged sword. It brings suffering. It also brings in blessing. Praise the name of Jesus. So these two people did not understand. They did not believe in suffering. They did not believe in death. They were those Christians that looked forward to a positive message. Messages of encouragement. Oh, pastor, you need a message of encouragement. Wait for a moment. We will not live by encouragement alone. Encouragement is not the only subject in the Bible. Praise the name of Jesus. There are times when you go through the valley of the shadow of death. And I want to call upon you to go to my YouTube channel, George Mulinga Ministries. And please remember to like, subscribe, and comment. And go through the series on training for kingdom rulership. You will be able to realize what a Dulam experience looks like. We will be picking up from there next Sunday. What I'm trying to say is that our life in Christ also entails sufferings. Amen. Amen. And let me say, it is the midst of sufferings where we easily give up. It is in the midst of our sufferings where we easily deny him. It is in the midst of our pain where we shift our attention to that which we have looked at for a long time. But let me tell you, it is in the midst of the suffering, just like Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego, those three Hebrew boys found themselves in the fiery furnace, and they realized right in their suffering, Jesus Christ was right in their midst. One as if you were son. Are you with me? Somebody lift up your hand and say hallelujah. hallelujah. One as if you were son. Now, this is really very good. What does the Bible tell us about understanding scripture? What does the Bible tell us about studying the word of God? What does the Bible tell us about understanding this book of prophecy? This word of God as God gave it. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Not to show yourself approved to man. But to show yourself approved Unto God. In other words, God wants you to understand the scriptures. Someone say amen. amen. To show yourself approved of God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of the truth. 
Praise the name of Jesus. So how did Jesus correct their ignorance? He corrected their ignorance by teaching them the scriptures. Amen. And most of the Christians today, particularly in Kenya, what they need are not miracles. What you need is not a miracle. Yeah? But the problem is that those Christians are chasing after miracles. What they need is a proper understanding of scripture. Well, I see you a son. It's a proper understanding of scripture. The Bible says, if you continue in my word, John 8, 32, from verse number 31, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It is the truth that we come to understand that brings up the total deliverance that we are looking for. The moment you get to understand the truth of the word of God, freedom comes in. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. How did he teach them the scriptures? He told them. It's not about just understanding this one facet of scripture. The Bible says in verse number 27, and beginning with Moses. Somebody say, and beginning with Moses. And beginning with Moses. And with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself. Hallelujah. Let me do a demonstration quickly. All the elders, please stand here. Okay, let me have a lady to strike a good balance. Marianne, come here. <laughs> Somebody say example, example. This is where Jesus is speaking and this is the point where the disciples are. And in between... The five books of the Bible, that is Genesis. Genesis. Uh-huh. Genesis. Uh-huh. Genesis. Uh-huh. Genesis. Uh-huh. Genesis. That is what the Bible calls the Pentateuch. Bible scholars call it Pentateuch, or the five books that Moses wrote. Hallelujah. So when you go to the scripture, it says, and beginning with Moses. Where did he begin? They began, Jesus began from the five books that Moses taught, the very first books of the Bible, he began to teach them concerning himself from Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. That is the foundation of knowing Jesus. When we were getting saved, we were told, go and read Matthew, John, and read the epistles. But when Jesus taught about knowing him and understanding the scriptures, he told them, begin from Moses. Tell your neighbor, begin from Moses. Moses. Tell somebody else, begin from Moses. Moses. Hallelujah. Amen. Elsewhere, Jesus said that Abraham knew my day. And when you talk about Abraham, the story of Abraham was written by Moses. Praise the name of Jesus. So from the five books, Jesus teaching them concerning every detail about him. And then the Bible says, through the prophets, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets. Look at how the scripture is arranged. Beginning with the five books and then the prophets. We have the major and the minor prophets in the Bible. That's how the Bible is written. He teaches them to the point where he was standing. He is the New Testament. Somebody say amen. He is the New Testament. So he teaches them the whole of the whole testament. Please be seated. What we find is that these disciples had not had a good handle of the Old Testament. And a lot of people don't have a good handle of the Old Testament. If you want to know God properly, look at the Old Testament. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. If you want to know Jesus, you will see him as a lamb that God sacrificed to take away the sin sin of Adam and Eve in the beginning in Genesis. If you want to know him, he is the tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness. Praise the name of Jesus. If you want to know him, he is that candle of golden stand. He is the bread of life. He is in the mercy seat. If you want to know Jesus, he is those lambs that were sacrificed. How those things pointed to Jesus. You see him in Isaac, a substitutional lamb that was offered 
for the sins of the people. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So you study. Jesus taught them everything about himself in the Old Testament. And I want to call upon this church. Look at you never tell them the pastor is crying. I want to call upon us. Let us get out of this business of supervisual teachings of the word of God. We remain ignorant even as we walk with Jesus until the day of our Lord Jesus comes. But when we make a radical decision to seek him, the Bible says you shall go to pray. You shall go to seek him. And when you seek him with all your heart, when you search the scriptures, you will find Jesus. Somebody say amen. Each one of us must have humble time where you search the scriptures by yourself. And a good thing to do, just take our notes and go study, look at those scriptures, you will be able to help yourself. Hallelujah. Go to the materials of foundation class. They will help you understand the scriptures. Hallelujah. This church is known by the teaching of scripture. Come on, let's get into the depths of scripture. Let there be no ignorant person in this house. Can somebody say amen? Amen. I pray that if Jesus stand in this house, today he would say, well done, thou good and faithful servants, because of your knowledge of scripture. But it would be a tragedy, it would be a disaster if Christ walked in here and he calls us foolish. The commentaries from Jesus should be good. So these people were now able to connect the Old Testament and the New Testament. Tell your neighbor, connecting the Old Testament and the New Testament. Praise the name of Jesus. The fifth thing I'm to work, working towards close, the fifth hymn, is that they recognized him when he broke the bread. When they went through the journey in the end, they arrived where they were going, entered in the house, and bread was brought to them because they came at the time of eating. They came at the time when dinner was being served. And as the dinner was served, the Bible says Jesus took the bread. Verse number 30, 31. And it came about when he had reclined on the table with them. He took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he vanished from their side. When he began to break the bread, that is a moment that their eyes were being opened up like this. You know what? The moment we get to know God, we get only to know Jesus when the bread of the word of God is broken. You will never get your eyes opened up when you are seated in a fellowship discussing politics. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, neighbor, get your eyes opened up. Hallelujah. All these guys needed to get their eyes opened up. Hallelujah. If you are not having your eyes opened up, then you are blind to the things of God. And we have so many blind people in the church. We need our eyes to be opened up. Hallelujah. The Bible says, if any man brags, let him brag that he knows me. You can imagine, these people have been blind for all this time. They have not understood. They are complaining, they are murmuring. You know, when you are hit by the revelation of the word of God, when God opens up your eyes, you stop that murmuring, you stop that complaining, you stop that rebellion, you stop that which does not glorify God in your lives. This man's life was completely changed because of that encounter with Jesus. And my prayer is that God gives us an encounter. Is that God gives us a personal experience with him. Hallelujah. So that our walk with him in this journey will not be a casual walk. It will be a casual of knowing him. Just like Paul cried that I may know him. I love the word of God. That I may know Christ. You can only love Christ. You can only learn about Christ if you're willing to get your eyes opened up. And we have cases in the Bible where not only these two men, their eyes were opened up. We have others whose eyes were opened up. And the moment they were opened up, their lives were never the same again. Ask Paul of Tarsus on his road to Damascus and he will tell you that his eyes were opened up. Our eyes are opened up when we break the bread. And I remember in 1993, we were in a conference and a preacher man was preaching. I don't remember what he was saying, but at that moment, 
my eyes were opened up. And when my eyes were opened up, it changed the equation. My understanding of scripture started to open up. Bible says in Ephesians 1, 18 to 21, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know that which is the hope of his calling and that which are the riches of the glory of his inheritance to the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us where it will believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above principalities and powers and might and dominions and every name that is named not only in this world but also in the world to come. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. And that scripture is what Paul talks about. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Are you willing do you want to know him? Do you want to get your eyes opened up so that you may be able, just like Paul, hallelujah, just like Paul, to be able to understand the power that raised him from the dead and not to complain about it and to be able to acquaint yourself with the fellowship of his sufferings, to identify with his sufferings so that when you go through sufferings, you don't complain, you don't murmur, you declare that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and they that are called in accordance to his word. And therefore, this is really very important when you begin to look at the words of Paul relative to what we find with these two disciples. And this leads us to the sixth point. I'm walking towards the end. The Bible tells us because of their eyes opened up, their hearts begin to burn within them. Verse number 32. And they said to one another, we are not our hearts burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road. Hmm. And while he was explaining the scriptures to us. Look at that. When he was speaking to us on the road. And while he was explaining the scriptures. You know, the experiences we need to have. You know, in our encounter with Jesus. Is that which burns every chaff. And every filthiness in our hearts is that freshness, that refiner's fire in the inside of us, that gets our hearts yearn, that our hearts crave for Christ. And look at Paul, the one that we are looking at in scriptures, and he says, I have been crucified with Jesus. Look at that. He sees nothing in this life. He is in his pursuit to know him. And therefore, he looks at his life being crucified with Christ. And the moment we get our hearts burning with us, the things of God gain greater value in our lives than anything else. The things of God gain greater value in our lives and in our hearts than any other necessary thing that we need in this life. When our hearts burn within us, God takes the center stage of our lives. It is a painful thing after you have walked with Christ for a long time and you begin to walk in a sluggish way. When your life begins to dwindle down, when the start of your life begins to go dull and you are not re-energized to be able to take up the journey of your life. That means you begin to walk away, to drift away from the faith. We need this fire to keep burning in us. So that we can be able to understand the scriptures. We understand why the things that happen to us have to happen in the way they happen. As a matter of fact, when you look at the Greek interpretation of this particular word, their hearts burning within them. And, you know, their eyes getting opened. It has a picture of curtains falling down or scales falling down from their eyes. In other words, their eyes were veiled before. They were not able to have a proper sight and a proper understanding who Jesus was. And as long as we don't have this encounter with Jesus, our eyes are veiled up. We have scales everywhere. 
and we really cannot feel with him. You know, it is this fire that burns within us that wakes you up in the night. You jump from the bed and you walk into your sitting room. You walk into your room and you begin to babble in prayer and in study of the word because your heart is burning, you are searching the Lord. Some of us, when we sleep, we never wake up until we are woken up by an alarm. When your heart is burning within you, you know, you stop anywhere and you can go somewhere and take time. I remember one time I was in the U.S. and a friend of mine called me and he said, George, can I meet you? I said, what are you doing? I said, he said, this week I have nothing to do. He's, the man is Jewish. And uh, so he said, I just want you to, uh, to have fellowship with you so that we can meet and discuss the scriptures. So the man drove all the way, about four or five hours to come to where I was. And when he came, we just got into a room somewhere. We discussed scriptures a little bit. You know David Rosen. And when we moved into the, to the room, I'm telling you, a Jewish man, it took us three hours praying in the room. I was wondering why we were praying. But we found ourselves just praying and praying. And just imagine a Jewish man given to prayer. The hearts has to burn within us. And many of our people in this church, we need some fire. Look at your neighbor, tell them you need some fire. We need that resurrection power that Paul wanted to know, that power that rose Jesus from the dead. We need some ignition in us so that we can give ourselves wholly to the things of God. Otherwise, we will be just like these two disciples. When that fire happened, the Bible says their hearts were burning within them. Their eyes were opened up. And now they were able to understand the scriptures. They were able to understand matters concerning the sufferings, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They looked at it now as necessary as it was ordained in scripture. And then the last thing, that ignorant and foolish disciples became effective witnesses of Jesus Christ. When that fire burns within us, you know, it is easy for us to be witnesses. We will be so hurt to see empty seats in the church. We would be wanting to bring another person so that they can have an encounter with Jesus. Verse number 35. And they told about all things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. They went talking about these things to the people. Praise the name of Jesus. So it took just that seven mile journey to be able to get the eyes of these people opened up. There's so much in scripture that you and me can be able to see. Let's stand up today and thank God. Today, unusually, we have spent some extra time, but what a joy that we can be able to comprehend the scriptures. This special day, this Resurrection Sunday, my prayer is that may God resurrect your heart. Your heart has been dead for a long time. Your eyes have been blind for a long time. May God ignite some fire today. I normally tell you, most of the Saturdays I don't even sleep because I got to sit the touch the scriptures. We were discussing yesterday with Madame. It is, you know, preparing psalms and doing what we do is the most difficult thing. Because it takes a lot of your time. Sometimes God will not even allow to flow in that spirit of understanding. And therefore we thank God for his faithfulness in our lives. Praise the name of Jesus. Look at your neighbor. Tell them neighbor. May God deliver you. May God help you. Come on, talk to somebody. Tell them neighbor. I have heard my part. And I am willing to walk in the word. Hallelujah. As we come to the end of our service, you're saying, Pastor, pray with me. I need God to walk with me in this journey. I need that revival that I used to have. I need a touch from God. You know, he's only a prayer away. And I want to pray with you wherever you are today. Lift up that hand and let's talk to God. Thank you for those hands. 
it's the desire of our hearts Paul said that I may know him and if there is a prayer that I need to pray for myself is that I may know him father thank you for those hands that are raised up by your people there is a desire there is a conviction that they need to know you just like Paul desired I pray in the name of Jesus that God by the power of your spirit Lord you will do a new thing in the lives of these beloved ones and God you will meet them at the point of their desires in the name of Jesus